Okay, so welcome back. Um, so as uh, as you might got an idea, levels uh, in this school again, and one level is uh, about physics, and this will be you know physics concept and uh, knowledge that we assume that everybody has, and so. Uh, before going to the to the more specific uh, discussions in the afternoon, and uh, now, okay. So the <coughs> the idea is to give you a, a very short introduction. We review really the basic feature of standard model that what we cared about in preparation of the BSM lectures, which will be more specific on models of models for new physics. So you will be, uh, as I was saying before, you. This week you'll be invested by a number of, uh, inf you know, a, lo a large number of information, some technical. So your your goal is to navigate, uh, right, without without being invested by the opposite wave here, and uh, keep uh, right uh, keep your attention to the final goal, which is uh, to get to the Fuji mountain alive, right, in the uh, in Japanese tradition. Okay, so I, I'll give you the basics of solar model. Tomorrow, Amrish will attack with the Higgs boson uh, physics, and then we will focus on the top four physics uh, on, on Wednesday morning. So, <coughs> real known solar model, right? So that's why I chose a slide from Hebrew, so not, you know, we get a bit more challenged in the uh, Looking at uh, this slide, I didn't find the Sanskrit one, but maybe. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no. I would like I mean, more, even more confusing than this, but uh, just to keep our uh, uh, all of us uh, awake. Um, so the the the, the symmetry of, the, of the, on this model are the the nose which we know, color, and the left week. Uh, Symmetries, which is not the simple group. I mean, uh, this is a part of, of two separate groups. Uh. So the fact that uh, these groups are uh, are separate means that the charges are conserved uh, independent of the other. There is no uh, nothing. You know, alpha s has nothing to do with uh, alpha weak, uh, and they are separately conserved. Now, we also know that uh, this picture is somewhat misleading. Because of the fact that the left-handed part of the of the particles of the, of the spinors couple in a different way from a right-handed one, and this uh, brings uh, to to this complexity of the standard model, which uh, we know often, which so what we don't explain yet. Now, uh, the other thing which is uh, uh, important, as you know, is that a low energy, the only symmetry we we can see is uh, U1 of electromagnetism, SU3 is uh, hidden, right, is hidden in the hadrons. All hadrons are singlets of the symmetry, and we are left with electromagnetism. Now, in the solar model, you have interactions are those which provide the fermion masses and also are the source of CP violation. This is true uh, in the quark sector, we have checked that already. Uh, in the lepton sector, in the neutrino, in particular, we're still uh, we're still looking into it. And we have no final uh, answer, and we also know there are, you know, if the neutrino is a major and this uh, um, Richard will talk about that, then we might also have additional source of CP violation, which could help us also in uh, in what is called the problem of biogenesis, right? The fact why there is an asymmetry in the universe between ma with between uh, matter and antimatter. Another property uh, that is important for, for this week is the fact that neutrinos have actually masses. And uh, um, while their nature is still not clear, we don't know if it's Iraq or Majorana particles, in fact, with, uh, the mi with respect to the minimal standard model where neutrinos are massless, we already know that something can you know, that needs to be added uh, to get uh, uh, to get to this term. So either it's a neutrino ride, right, that needs to be added, and this is new physics, 
a neutrino right will be um, a singlet under all symmetries of the standard model. And the, the interesting thing is that if the neutrinos are Majorana, actually uh, we know, right, uh, we will know that something has to happen most from before the, the plug scale. So this is something which uh, also can be described with the LFT field theory and is given as an example normally that there is only one operator of dimension 5, and that's the Weinberg operator, is the operator that gives masses to the Majorana neutrino. And this effectively is the first sign of new physics that we see, right? So this is an argument for saying that uh, the minimal version of the standard model that we know is, is, already, um, is already old, right? I mean, we have to extend it. The other property of this model is the anomaly free, uh, as you know, there is this uh, uh, symmetry which are broken by quantum effect, which magically cancels in the standard model. Establish a relation, for example, between the number of colors and the fractional charge uh, of the quarks, which is something which remains a mystery. The other point, uh, which is extremely important and has been always sold uh, to all of us uh, as the great feature, the greatest feature of the standard model, is the fact that uh, it's a renormalizable theory. Right? So we have always been uh, taught in school that uh, the standard model. Uh, is valid to arbitrary scale, and this is a fantastic property of our theory. Well, you know, with, the, with our present knowledge, uh, it's actually a bit the opposite, right? Because uh, unfortunately, since it's renormalizable, we don't know where it breaks. And uh, since we don't know where it breaks, we, don't, we have no clue where new physics is. Right? It's not from theory. From experiments, we might, we might look at other um, phenomena which we cannot describe. But from theory, from the model itself, we have no clue uh, of where it will break. As far as we know, we can go easily up to the Planck scale without anything going wrong in this model. Okay. So instead of being the best of all processes, it's, it's turning against us in uh, not giving us any light or any indication of where new physics might be. So, now, I'm going to be fast. I hopefully finish before, uh, before the lecture. So now you fasten your belt because I, 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 really, uh, I really speed up uh, in this. So uh, you are supposed to know all of this. If uh, you don't know something or I'm saying something wrong, it happens. You raise your hand and uh, you say, well, I didn't get this. What are you saying and so on. So far, so good. We all agree on uh, so far? OK. So. As I said, one of the features of the southern model is that uh, the left-handed spinners, the right-handed spinners, transform differently under the gauge group. Huh? So the left-handed one are in a doublet of SU2, and with respect to SU2, and uh, this is called the weak isospin. There are three generators, right, in SU2. There are three gauge bosons, which we call the W1, WD, W2, and W3. And then we have a U1, an extra U1, which Weinberg had to include because at the end we know that there will be one massless um, gauge mediator in our theory, which will be the photon. And therefore, uh, we add a group uh, which is abelian, which is a weak uh, hypercharge, and we call it Y. Okay. Now, the, the, obviously, the quantum numbers of a null abelian gauge field are fixed, uh, right? there is no freedom in normalization. When those of the U1 are, as far as we know, uh, a continuous of value, right? I mean, there is no quantization for U1 of charges. However, as we will see in the standard model, the U1 at the end, the, the numbers are fixed uh, by requirement uh, that the, the electric charge uh, is corresponding to what we see in low energy experiment. So we gauge this uh, Lagrangian in the usual way. So we promote the, the global symmetry to a local one. We introduce a covariant derivative. And this leads to several terms in the Lagrangian, which look complicated. It's a bit, uh, so it's like the t-shirt, uh, right? It was uh, shown before in the standard model. And then <laughs> when you actually look at the spins and so on, it becomes a bit uh, like a suit, uh, right? Uh, a bit longer uh, than usual. So apart from the kinetic term, which are obvious, 
there are charge current and there are neutral current. And the charge current, okay, they will link neutrino and electron. I'm looking only for electron right now. The neutral current are a bit weird, if you remember. Right? The, the, the neutral current, you would say, well, the means are related to electromagnetism. Well, they are not, right? They are not, well, first because the left ended is not a vector interaction, so the left and right ended have different uh, couplings. And the other thing which is weird is that the neutrinos are left uh, and uh, um, uh, the neutrinos have, uh, uh, have an interaction which is neutral. Right? So obviously it cannot be electromagnetism because the neutrinos are chartless. So uh, neutral current uh, uh, are coupled. So one thing that we can do right, is to rotate uh, W3 and B, uh, so that we can interpret, uh, we can reconstruct uh, for the left, for the left hand, we, we are able to reconstruct a current which is vectorial. Okay? Not, I'm not asking yet anything about masses and so on. I'm only identifying out of this uh, combination a way of rotating in such a way that uh, uh, my current, I identify a current which I call A. Which is, uh, uh, which is behaving like a photon, which is vectorial. Uh, when left hand and the right hand are the same. If I do this, I do this Weinberg rotation, which, is, uh, um, which relates the charge E with the uh, weak, the, um, uh, the doublet, right, coupling, G, and this angle, same theta doublet. Okay. So these are uh, already somewhat hints uh, right, at the unification between the electric charge and the weak charge. Something which, uh, from the low energy theory, it remains mysterious. Right? The weak interactions are much weaker than the electromagnetic one, uh, and the fact that they actually unify from the low energy theory, it, says, it, it, it provides us some kind of mystery. And this relation is obvious after, it is obvious, uh, somewhat doesn't, doesn't shock us if we don't think about the phenomenology. Because if we think about the phenomenology, it doesn't make any sense. Right? Because uh, we find that the, a weak coupling, which is order of magnitude smaller, is uh, similar to the electric coupling. There's something missing here, which, uh, of course, is the masculine initial mechanism, um, which we will discuss in a moment. Okay. So this is the uh, Germani Shima formula. And as I said, remember, T3 is the generator of the representation of SU2. So if it's in the doublet, it's one half minus so one half, this is fixed. Eh? So the only way the only way we can tune things to get what we want is uh, through uh, this uh, charge uh, and this uh, um, hypercharge uh, Y, which gives us the possibility of having a charge which is different to zero. So the right end the neutrinos uh, will give us uh, zero charge, zero hypercharge, a S2 singlet, right? So even if we introduce it at the beginning, the right and the neutrino will decouple, and unless uh, the neutrino masses, which uh, is the case, uh, as you know, these are decoupled completely. Now, if we apply this transformation to our neutral current, we, we discover, right, we impose this, so we get a mu, which couples vectorially, which means that in the same way as left ended and right ended, right? So we will get uh, electromagnetism on this side. And then we find, amazingly enough, that this other neutral boson, which uh, is a linear combination with uh, W3 and uh, B, mu, couples to the, to the leptons in a way which is non trivial, right? It, it depends on the, if it's an up or down. And uh, it has this term, which comes from the mixing uh, of uh, the U1, uh, of, um, of the big U. So we, once we get, so knowing all the, char the electric charges of the, of the quark and the leptons, then we are able to reconstruct the hypercharges. And then we can uh, very easily uh, reveal the, all the assignments of uh, hypercharge uh, of all the uh, particles in the solar model. 
So in an ideal, the notation, right, when, when we talk about particles in the doublet, we use a common notation for both, right, which is QL. This will be useful later when Ken will give uh, his lectures on, on uh, EFT. And then typically, uh, we use a lower letter for the right and the particles, which uh, uh, transform differently. Okay. So doublets are capital, and lower letter are uh, right and the parts, which are uh, singlet under SU2. Is that clear? Very good. So this notation is what we will keep using, okay, in the following. Uh, so one exercise that you can do here already is to show that with these assignments, anomalies in the standard model cancel. This is a typical exercise that you do in your standard model class, which uh, I, you, you, can, uh, you can redo it here. Now, masses. So how do we, first of all, we have two, two problems, phenomenological and low energy, which we have to describe. The first one, as I mentioned already, is that the weak interactions are much weaker than the electromagnetic ones, problem number one. The second problem, we actually find that the uh, range of the weak interaction is finite, right? They don't, they don't extend a, lo a long range. So the natural way of uh, uh, thinking about that is to give a mass to the vector boson, right? So the most natural way to determine interaction, which is a, a finite range, a la Yukawa, is to introduce a mass for the, for the mediator, right? Because the mediator, if it has a mass, basically it will give an exponential decay in the interaction threads. Okay? So the most natural thing to do is to say, well, we add a mass term to the gauge, uh, to the gauge interaction, and then everybody starts jumping on his chair and say, no, no, you cannot do that, right? Why? Why, why we cannot do that? We cannot give a mass to a gauge boson. To a gauge boson. Why? What's wrong with that? Yeah, but it's not true, right? It's not true. Yeah, so, okay, let, let me do the, the argument again, right? So, the, um, so we are, we are learned and we are all taught, right? And if I, if I write this term, in the Lagrangian, I violate gauge invariance because uh, I make a, a, a transformation of, on a mu, right, with a derivative, and I get an extra term, and that thing violates gauge invariance. So I cannot do it. Right. Well, so this is, I mean, the derivation is correct. The problem is that gauge invariance is not a symmetry on my theory, right? It's a redundancy on my description. I don't care about gauge invariance. Gauge invariance uh, at this level, it's just uh, something that tells me that this vector has two physical, you know, if it's massless, has two physical components. And when I, I write it in my Lagrangian, I have four, because I say mu. So I have four components. But I, I, need, I know that the only physical one are two. So my description is redundant. And therefore, I must have some kind of relation to kill this redundancy. Right, to get rid of this redundancy. And if I keep my Lagrangian in this way, I have to deal with the fact that I can redefine my field and still get the same physics. So, what I'm doing here, what I'm only thing I'm showing is that this term does not respect this, this thing. It does not respect this uh, redundancy. But if I fix the redundancy, if I fix my gauge, maybe that term is fine. It's just that the way I write it is only one, and this one thing is only valid in one gauge and not all in all gauges. And this is, in fact, what happens, right? So for U1, there is no problem of writing a mass term. So rem remember this, right? Because this uh, is also a source of confusion sometimes. For U1, for electromagnetism, I can give a mass to the photon. The theory is completely consistent. There's nothing wrong with it. It's called Proca field. It has three degrees of freedom now because it has a longitudinal component. And the fact that this term doesn't satisfy 
Then she remarks, I don't care. I fix the gate on my lunch and I work in that name. Okay. So how do I prove this? There are two ways of proving it. There is one way which is called the Stackelberg mechanism. So you give a mass uh, in this way. Or you use a Higgs mechanism, the one we are, which we are using. And then you decouple, right? You take a special limit, which is called the Stackelberg limit. And then you show that this model done with the Higgs mechanism has a massive photon and the Higgs has decoupled completely from your theory. Right? You take a limit, uh, it's written in the following slide, so you can play with it if you want. So you're left with a massive U1. No, nobody will ever complain about that. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. So this is uh, summarized here. If you take a, a Higgs mechanism, you take the charge going to zero, lambda going to zero, V to infinity, but you keep uh, these two terms constant, you get a massive photon, the E set the couple, and you're all good, right? So, U1, there is no problem. Now, the problem is that for SUN, you cannot do that. Right? So, it's the non abelian gauge field theory which don't allow a mass term. The abelian one, they don't care about the mass term, it's fine. But the non abelian one, that you cannot, without, without breaking these invariants in a bad way, in a way which you don't recover. So one way to understand it easily is the fact that, you see, in the abelian case, uh, you can take the limit, E, which goes to zero, and you're still left with a gauge field which is abelian. Now, if you have an abelian theory, and you take G, right, G of the non-abelian theory, to zero, you destroy the non-abelian part of the theory, right? So you end up into an abelian one, because G regulates the interaction with the fermions, but it also is, uh, regulates the self-interaction of the gauge theory, right? That, that's the duty of the gauge theory. There's only one parameter in, a, in an abelian gauge theory. The parameter which regulates regulate the non-abelian interaction is the same that is the coupling to the fermions, right? The quark, the coupling to the quark of uh, QCD is G, but the coupling of the gluon to a gluon is also G, okay? So if you send G to zero, you switch off the non-abelian part, and you're left with the non-abelian one, okay? So there is no way of, of doing the same thing that I was talking about for non-abelian theory. In general, when you start working with it, you see that if you add the mass to the gluon, you break everything, right? You don't get consistent results. So it's not that you have a redundancy. You really break the nature of the, 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 nature of the theory itself. Okay, so unfortunately, uh, and these uh, people have realized uh, a long time ago, I cannot add a mass like that to an SUN theory. So what do I have to do? Well, I have to do something else. In fact, again, there is another subtlety, right? Uh, there is another subtlety. I mean, I can do that if I realize, we say technically, we realize the symmetry non-linearly, okay? So this is a bit, uh, this I like a little bit less, in the sense that uh, it's a bit playing with the uh, war. But, you know, this theory we know is a theory of piles. And the same is the same Lagrangian of pious. And you can write a theory which is massive, right, and still uh, as a gauge uh, interaction, uh, which uh, is nonlinear in the sense that you see this field uh, sigma is exponential of a field, so my theory is nonlinear. So what's wrong with that? Nothing. I can do it. However, now, no. This theory is not renormalizable, right? So we have trained renormalizability for masses, for introducing masses into my gauge theory. Okay, so remember that so what we have always to uh, give something back, and what we are giving back here is the fact that this theory is perfectly gauge invariant, has masses, but is not renormalizable. So it's uh, it says a cutoff. Is this a problem? 
Well, actually, it was our blessing, right? Because uh, if this theory actually accommodated all the degrees of freedom that we knew before the start of the late phase, except for the Higgs particle. The Higgs is not here. Okay? The Higgs is not in this model. Right? I don't need the Higgs in this model. So if I don't need the Higgs, I, you know, I can build a theory. However, it will break. And I know that it will break at scale of order of one TV. Okay, so this was our best theorem ever, right? This allows us to get the billions of euros from all our funding institutions to bring the LHC. It's the failure of this effective theory that allows us to convince our authorities and, si and funding agency to give us the money to build the LHC and then to discover the hit. This, this is the argument, it's no more than this. It's the fact that uh, the effective field theory of W and Z self interacting will, will grow, right? The amplitude, the X wave amplitude will grow with energy. And uh, you remember from school, right? From the past and so on, that if you have an amplitude which is growing with energy, this will violate, uh, will violate unitarity, will violate the fact that quantum mechanics. Uh, uh, asks uh, for conservation of probability, right? Because this grows too much. And therefore, you will need something to fix it. We don't know if it's a Higgs. We didn't know if it was a Higgs or not. We didn't know. Still, we knew we could build a collider and we find it out. Okay. So this was fantastic uh, news. Now, there is something interesting about this. is the fact that actually, uh, in the standard model, the problem of masses for the W and Z um, is related, right? It's Weinberg that uh, is realized this uh, again. It is also can be related or solved in the same way that the fermion masses, the problem of fermion masses is. Because I, should, I didn't mention it before, but I can also non linearly realize the, a mass term for the fermions. And nothing is wrong with that again. However, even this theory will break uh, down at the scale. It grows slower, right? This amplitude is proportional to the mass of the fermion, the elicity violating one. This will grow, and also this one uh, needs some fixing. In the third model, I remind you again that the fixing of this problem and of this problem is together. Okay? The Higgs mechanism fixes both at the same time. So once you have fixed this one, you fix this for free in the solar model. However, this is not, has not to be the case necessarily. Right? Just back on our mind, we should keep this in mind. Right? Because when uh, we ask ourselves why the top is much heavier than the, uh, the other frame and so on, maybe the reason is that this thing is not actually realized as we think it is, but it's a bit more complex than that. Okay, is this clear? Do you all agree on this? Okay. So how we realize this? Uh, in a, line a linearly way, right? So let's forget for a second the non-linearly realized one. Well, we broke the symmetry spontaneously, so I'm not going to go into detail. The idea, as you remember, is that the Lagrangian keeps the symmetry, but the vacuum, so the lowest energy state, breaks the symmetry. Okay? So I will break some of the generators. I will generate this Gibbs Goldstone, but in a gauge theory, this also is pseudo Goldstone, and then re-enter and give uh, the longitudinal polarization of my gauge models. So what do I do? I add uh, a linearly with time, right? I take a field which has four components, and I add it it's Lagrangian, right? I add it to the standard model, and I couple it, because it's a doublet of SU2, I couple it to uh, my gauge fields. And uh, uh, I minimally couple, right? There's not, nothing strange with it. Now, the other thing which I, I, I like to appreciate again for the end time in your life is the fact that the potential, when you need a specific form of the potential to get this breaking out of zero configuration. And in the standard model, the potential 
is super simple. It's part of, of uh, this renormal enzymability uh, concept that we keep in our mind, right? We can only add oxidation and substitution for, and therefore we only have two terms, uh, two, that, uh, that can be added, right? So one, uh, so we have two parameters. I do this electronic symmetry breaking. I call V the value of the vacuum expectation value of the X on the, you know, on the mix field. And this I fix it to V. So this is one degree of freedom, V. And uh, the other one is the mass of the heat at a low energy. So once I know V, wh where do I get, uh, um, where do I get information from V, on V, from? Well, what, how do I fix V in the standard model, experimentally? What is the measurement that allows me to fix the value of V to 246 uh, GV. Hmm? Four? Yeah, the Fermi, yeah, but where, where, yeah, but the word we measure it. Okay? No. Wrong? Not slightly wrong. No. Muon decay. It's the muon decay. Right? You don't get V from NW or on Z. Remember this is this in the following super important. Okay? So remember uh, V comes from the muon decay. From GF, uh, as you connect the say from GU. But the, from a low energy measurement that depends only on V. MW depends on V and G, right? But G, I mean, I don't know what G is, right, here, right? So I, I, I cannot fix uh, V from MW and G. And that's exactly the reason why we didn't know where the mass of the W and mass of the Z were exactly, even though we had the measurement of GF and O energy. Is that clear? So this, this should keep this in mind because uh, in the EFT part of Ken, this is essential okay, to get this point. So V is the scale, is the scale, right? It's not a mass. It's a different dimensions actually than, than a mass. Anyway, uh, V is the scale, and V I get from the mu decay. Then lambda here, so mu, let's say I fix it, I use it, lambda, Lambda, I get it from the mass of the heat, because the mass of the heat depends on lambda and V. Okay, so once I measure the mass of the heat, everything else in the potential is fixed, because there is nothing else. Okay, there are two parameters, GF and um, M heat, let's say. So the, why I'm saying this? Because there is a very important measurement, and Amrish will talk at length about this, which is the measurement of the self-coupling of the heat, uh, which uh, uh, we don't almost know anything about, which people get confused because they say, well, what do I have to know about? I mean, it's all fixed to the Lagrangian. Right? So in the standard model, all the self-couplings are fixed, but if you go beyond the standard model, we don't know. Okay? But in the standard model, there are only two parameters. Very good. So then you remember there is this story of the unitary gate. I'm not so you make manifest the content of the uh, of your theory, the mass content of your theory by choosing a special gate, which is only due to the fact that you are spontaneously breaking a gauge symmetry. Very good. Uh, this is not very essential to our argument. However, uh, what we know, right, is that there will be two directions in these uh, three generators, I, I start with three generators of SU2, and there will be two directions which are broken, and one direction which is not broken, and this will say the photon, which will say massless, right? So I have seen poles that the unbroken direction is actually the A mu, which I defined before. I have to build it in a way that this happens, and that's exactly what's shown here, right? They're all broken, 
apparently, there are four directions which are broken, but in reality, there are only three which are broken, one is unbroken, and this direction which is unbroken is the photon direction. So, I break and I broken three symmetries out of S2 times in one. So for the Gaussian theorem, I will have three pseudo Gaussian bosons, right? And these three pseudo Gaussian bosons will end up as massive uh, as components of the of the longitudinal uh, vector boson. So uh, again, I go back to the potential, right? I rewrite my potential around the minimum. And they find something interesting, right? That the mass, as I said, depends on lambda and v. So I, I can train lambda for an age, and I'm done. And then also, that the three linear and quadrilinear coupling of these are equal to lambda and are fixed. There is no freedom whatsoever to play with the subcoupling of these once I know its mass. Okay? So, question again, I said it before, but just to be clear. Do we have information on this coupling and on this coupling? Very weak, basically no, right? We have some information that is not very useful up to now. So this is one of the most important measurements that we have to do at the high lumi LAT. Okay. Uh, for the, I mean, I, I think, well, yeah, so um, this you, you will explain, right, uh, tomorrow. Right. No, Ambrish will be on you, so it's, you are in the trajectory of my figure. But <laughs> I meant Ambrish, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, okay. So it, it's, uh, it's a long discussion on what point to, but yeah, it, it's difficult, right? This measurement is very difficult. This is <laughs> super difficult, right? So uh, it's very hard. So let's go back to the masses. Uh, so, remember that the masses for this H boson come from the kinetic term uh, of, this, of this guy here, right, of the heat. And when you go down, right, the masses, as we said before, the mass of the W, the mass of Z, depend on V, but also on the gauge coupling. That's the mechanism. And uh, GF, now, GF does not depend on the gauge coupling, right, because it cancels. So in, the, in, the, in the our theory, V is totally related to GF, eh? it's the same thing, and there's no relation with the strength of the gauge coupling. Right? I cannot measure, I don't know the strength of the gauge coupling from a measurement of V. Okay. And then the other thing I learned is that uh, uh, the Ws and the Z couples to the Higgs. Eh? in a way which is fixed by this term, right? Because you see, this term has a 1, and this gives the masses, but it has also a heat field, and this fixes the three linear and the quadrilinear coupling between two z's and two w's and one x or two x's. So the, in the standard model, remember, this is also useful to remember, all the four-point interactions are fixed by the three point one. And in QCD, in this case, all of them. There's no freedom whatsoever to change the four point and not the, the three and so on. Right? So it's all it's all it's all constrained, not fixed. There's no way of deforming this by uh, by any arbit there's no arbitrary parameter. Everything is fixed by the low energy. So what are our masses? As I said, the masses come up almost for free. It's a bit more complicated because uh, you remember, right, the masses are complex parameters, right? In, in Java, you have to ask the Lagrangian to be Hermitian, so you end up with matrices which mix the flavor. So you have, you have all these flavor stores which are not uh, going into uh, right now. So at the end, you have to diagonalize this mass matrix. And uh, to make a, a long story short, what happens is that when, we, when you diagonalize the mass matrix, it turns out that all the neutral currents become diagonal also. Remember? So the neutral weak current in the standard model are diagonal. There is no flavor changing neutral current in the standard model. 
and the only flavor changing currents are charged. Okay. So this is also a property which is extremely important. And the other point is that now the coupling of the fermion to the X is only linear, not quadratic. There are no four point interactions here, which would be only normalizable. Okay. There are only uh, three point interactions, and this coefficient is not arbitrary. So once you know the mass, you also know how the heat couple to the fermion. There is no freedom. One, I know, once I know one, they are one, I get the other automatically. Okay. So there are many ways I can test the thermal model. Right? Because all this structure is constrained by the structure of my theory. You cannot write out. Masses are related to the in cover coupling, the three linear related to the quadrilinear. There is no freedom. Everything is like a puzzle which has to, to get uh, exactly in, piece in, uh, in the right place, each piece in the right place. Okay, so in the end, uh, once you diagonalize this story, as I said, you get the mass term which uh, regulates the Yukawa and also uh, the mass itself of the particle. Okay. Now, uh, this is a mixing I don't, I don't care very much. So, what I end up with, well, I end up with this uh, scheme of couplings where uh, it's useful, right, to, to keep it. So, this is not the way we normally are taught. So, this, yes, right, that the mass of the fermion is linearly uh, proportional to the coupling. But sometimes, you know, most of the time, we are not taught that the, the coupling of the x to the w is quadratic. Okay? And uh, why is quadratic? Because again, uh, here, if I write it in this way, which is the book, uh, standard book uh, way of writing it, I'm hiding a g in the mass of the w. Right? So mass of the w is proportional to the weak coupling itself. So the coupling effect is quadratic in the mass of the w. Okay? So it's much much easier, at least for my brain, it's much easier to, to remind, you know, to recall the need, which is a scalar, coupled to the, to the vector boson quadratically with their mass, not linearly. Okay, it's quadratic. And the same is true, right, the same is true for uh, the self-coupling, which we normally write that way, by the way, right? So, all the bosons couple quadratically, and then the fermions couple linearly. It's much easier, at least for me, to, rem to remember this. And final thing, which I already stressed, the, quadrat the quadrilinear couplings are all fixed by the gauge theory. Okay. So this is uh, my, uh, you know, uh, uh, to which extent we have proven these relations. So this is also why uh, uh, many who, who have seen this plot before, or his brother? Nobody? So it's an experimental plot. Eh? So it's by Atlas, and then CMS has one similar one. So if you, if you haven't seen it, I, I, I explain it. So it's um, on the x axis, uh, you have the mass, the mass as you measure it, right? For quarks, there's a, bit, uh, there's a little bit of a subtlety there, but let's forget about this for a second. So it's the mass as measured, the mass of the Higgs, sorry, not the, the Higgs, because the Higgs is not there, but the mass of the top, the mass of the W, the mass of the D here. And the, here is the coupling, linear or the square root of it, right? Because uh, we said that the bosons have quadratic dependence, not linear. And then I plot what, what, I, what I have to learn, right, experimentally, is that these all couplings should stay on the line now. Because uh, in the standard model, uh, they are related. They are on the same axis. Right? They are, they are on, the, on, the, on the straight line. So this is uh, what we find. And indeed, as uh, Rami said uh, this morning, right, we strongly believe uh, that they, what we have discovered is actually the heat. This is one of the plots that we use uh, to convince ourselves or to 
to sustain our belief, right? Because they all actually, to the extent we can tell, right? They all lie on the on the line, right? So the son of Lord of Phoenicia is is uh, verified to the extent we know. So there are missing missing pieces here. What is missing from this plot? What well, which particle is missing? The his? The his is missing. Why why we need a plot the his? We know the mass of the his. 125.09 We know it super well. Why we didn't put it? We don't know the self coupling, right? We don't we, we don't know the self coupling. So we, we, we cannot we cannot plot we don't have any independent measurement on the self coupling. We only have the one from the mass, but not an independent one. So we cannot plot it here. And then what else is missing? Hmm? The light fermion, right? The charm, the strange, the up and down electron, uh, and the muon is not there. The tau, sorry, the muon is not there. This is an upper bound. This is actually an upper bound. It's not a measurement yet. Uh, so the tau is there. So we only have third generation and gauge bosons. And we don't know anything about second generation uh, and first generation. Right. Who knows? Right. We don't know. Maybe the X doesn't couple to the neuron. Or maybe, in, well, it cannot couple much more strong than we, we predicted, because otherwise this would be a measurement, while it is only a, an upper bound. Okay. So we have two main open problems <coughs> on the heat. The heat starts coupling. These are unknown. So when we say, ah, the solar model has been tested, what? Right, right, you know, yes, but we're still missing a, a big chunk of it. Okay. No, I don't think it has, has, has nothing to do with that, the neutralization. The reason is that uh, the scale at which uh, you probe uh, uh, this coupling, uh, sorry, this coupling, is the scale of the mass of the Higgs. And the mass of the Higgs uh, is much higher than the neutralization scale. So, so what you are at much smaller distances with respect to what you would uh, experience problem from the neutralization. You are order of magnitude different, right? So the, the length, the units of length where you are probing this coupling is completely different from the neutralization scale. So there is no problem in um, mixing the two. This, what you, are, what you are saying though, is relevant when we actually, I'm trying to link this point here to the plot where, you, you see, what is the mass of the B? What is the mass, normally, what, what we say the mass of the B is? If I, if I open the PDG and I read the mass of the B, what, what do I read? 4.7, right, 4.75. That's a pole mass, right, it's a, it's a, 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 a pole in the propagator, and so it's, let's say, 5, and if you look at here, you have 1, 2, 3, right, so this point is measured at 3, and you say, what? Well, I mean, okay, maybe because it's wrong. Uh, no, right, because this, this mass, which we are talking, they, they added uh, this line after people start complaining. Uh, so they ended this mass because what you're actually me um, predicting with the solar model is the MS bar mass measured in the mass of the Higgs. And this we can see if the pole mass is 4.7, that one is 3, right? It's roughly 3. So that, that's okay. So there are two different masses, right? There is a pole mass, which is related to the hydraulic light of the heat, and then there is an MS bar mass, which is an electroweak uh, parameter. Yeah, yeah. So the, the limitation, yeah, but that's not my, you know, it's not my problem. I mean, uh, experimentalists are smart, and they will need to get smarter and get a charm tagging. 
my that's not my issue. Um, there are also external external Yeah, yeah. There is a new. Uh, it's already out in Swiss cast. Is uh, Gilad? Yeah, yeah. Gilad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So then there are uh, um, there are attempts to ch to touch the flavor, even light flavor, like strange or charm, which is not heavy enough to be clearly identified. Right, the mistagging things are are too are too bad. There are other ways also. Eh? There are other ways. There is a, there is also possibility of trying to get it from the loop of the heat, uh, the loop of glue glue to heat, uh, from the PK, anyway. So, I'm uh, almost done. Uh, so one can go back to this non-linear realization and say, oh, well, now you told me that uh, if it's linearly realized, you don't have, a, I mean, my theory is uh, normalizable, is uh, unitary up to arbitrary scale. Well, that's indeed the case. That's indeed the case because the diagrams which have uh, the heat. Hmm? Uh, if you add the heat, you will also have this diagram, T channel and other diagram. And this one, when you add them quantistically, so at the level of amplitude, this guy has an opposite phase when you start to the first two. And it cancels, magically, it cancels the bad behavior with the energy. In this amplitude, and uh, even more interestingly, I think, in this amplitude too. Okay. So why more interestingly? Why? Because here you see it's the same coupling of the heat, right? Both on this side and on this side. So you're not really sensitive to the phase of the coupling here, right? Because it enters twice. But here. You are sensitive because it enters only once. And the other one is the coupling of the heat to the fermion, which you are also sensitive to the phase of because of this. So now the fermions are more tricky, right? They're more tricky because the cancellation for the fermions is less trivial now because it depends uh, on the relative phase of the Yukawa coupling with respect to the Higgs coupling to the W. Okay, so this is uh, something interesting. And now you can imagine, right, that uh, um, if you now say that the Yukawa coupling of the top uh, is opposite sign with respect to this standard value, model value, but it has the same absolute value, you screw up the standard model immediately, right? So you may imagine that there are actually processes at the LHC where that if we flip uh, the sign of the Yukawa, we're going to get crazy cross-sections. No? Because uh, this will be a crazy cross-section, like something is closer in energy. In fact, we do have, uh, we have, uh, well, one of them is uh, X to gamma gamma, because the X to gamma gamma as a loop of W, and it's also a loop of TOS. And if you remember from school, these two terms cancel to some extent. They don't cancel exactly, right? The top one is much smaller, but they have opposite sign. And then there is a famous uh, uh, process in the next which is called single top uh, uh, plus X, uh, where you, if you flip the sign there, you get 10 times bigger cross section. Okay. So, this thing is not academic. And we can test it. Uh, and then I see, and we have already tested it. If you remember the earlier plot on the limits of the Yukawas were uh, degenerate in the sign of the Yukawas, but nowadays they're not degenerate anymore. They don't even plot the, the negative sign anymore. Okay. Because our measurement has been enough. Okay. So the, this is you know, to, to, to complete the story. Then uh, uh, I have two other small uh, uh, arguments. So who knows about the story of naturalness? Uh, have you heard of it? At least. Right. So uh, naturalness is a, is a tricky story, very tricky, because uh, it depends uh, whom uh, you ask to. 
And so my suggestion is to ask to the largest number possible people ever you meet, uh, because it will be funny. It will, it will be great for you to actually probe uh, the system in different uh, phases. And uh, so I, I, I don't want to give uh, any bias. I just give you a formulation which at least uh, is clear, at least in my mind. Right? Because every time it's a bit difficult to phrase it. So uh, what, what is a, a nice way to phrase it? The ni for me, a nice way is that you take uh, a, uh, the standard you know, a, a, a toy model where you have two scalars. Who, who, has, who has seen this uh, phrasing on the hierarchy problem done in this way before, probably? So uh, it's a bit technical, but at least it's clean. Okay. So you take two scalars, you you write the two, the terms right that you can write by being normalizable. There are only four plus one because you can talk. They can talk to each other, right? It is like uh, the single attestation of the standard model. It's, uh, it's like that, right? They talk to each other. So now what you do, uh, you, you, keep, uh, you keep it V2, you don't break anything, right? you don't do any uh, signature breaking or anything. But what you do, you calculate in one loop uh, the connection to the mass of the light state due to loops uh, of the light one and of the heavy one, which couples. Right? So you will have a, a loop where you have a, a heavy one and a light one running in the loop. You have both. And if you do that, uh, you see there are corrections, no? Correction to this. One correction is proportional to the mass of itself, but what the other one, which depends on the mixing, depends on the heavy guy. Right? You normalize it, right? And you're left with the log. And now, uh, now you write the RGE, so you derive this, to, this uh, thing here with respect to mu uh, squared. And you see that the running, the running of this parameter, right, is a short uh, distance parameter, depends on the mass squared and on the heavy mass. Depends on both. And now you see also from this expression that you can choose mu, so the, uh, the renormalization scale, you can choose what you want, but you will, you will be stuck, no? Because uh, if you choose mu, equal to m, you cancel this term. But if you choose, and this gives you a large log, yeah? and a term which is proportional to m squared, or vice versa, right? Then you have a large log yeah, here if you, use, if you choose m capital M. So you see that what happens is that if you, if you try to get rid of this guy, by choosing a normalization point at some point, then by running, you will get it back. So it's only in one point of the, of the RGE which you can put it to zero. Then the running will generally be back. And so there's no way of getting rid of this M squared here. So what does it mean? What do you have here? You have a model where M is calculable, M, uh, small m, Small m is calculable in the model, right? Because I can write it. This is calculable. And this calculable uh, dimensional parameter depends on a very heavy scale, no matter what I do. There's nothing I can do. It will always depend on this heavy scale, which can be as heavy as I, can, as I want. It will never be calculable. Okay? So, how do I get the so how do I fix this guy here? The only way is to fine tune delta. Right? The only way is to say, well, these two terms uh, uh, are similar. And the only way to get these two terms similar is that I fine tune delta as proportional to the ratio of m squared over m capital M. That's the only way. I have to fine tune delta with lambda, with respect to lambda, to satisfy this relation. There's no other way. So, in a model where m, a low scale, is calculable and depends on physics at a high scale, 
there is no other way of doing some kind of fine tuning to get uh, M much smaller than M capital M. There's no other way. So you don't need effective theory, you don't need, uh, uh, you know, this uh, lambda, you don't need anything. You just take a model like that, and uh, this, you see it has a problem. Right. And this problem, you might, you might say, so what? Right. I find you it, and then I match it. Yeah, that's okay. You are allowed to do that. But still, in the back of your mind, uh, you are somewhat uneasy. No, because uh, somehow it, tell, it tells you that you cannot choose your, your theory at low energy without knowing what is your UV theory, which uh, is not the way we work, right, normally. We only look at a system at a given energy, and then we look at the symmetries of the system, we build the Lagrange allows on the symmetries and the interaction, and we don't care what is in the what will be in terms of the 19 degrees. We can, physics doesn't depend on that. And all our knowledge of physics is based on these assumptions. And so this will break it. So people don't, don't like it. Okay? But if you are, uh, if you are fine in fine tuning, then you will switch well. Okay. And then there is another story, which is vacuum stability. But this is a, it's not really a problem in the solar model, as far as we know. So I will not spend time and stop here. Um, so for me, this is not a problem. You might know it, right? I mean, uh, the, the lambda, right? The lambda of the solar model runs and gets two big contributions, one from itself, uh, one from the initial of the top. So if you go at very high energy, you might destroy right, the, this, this structure, which gives you the minimum of the heat. Uh, and uh, uh, this depends critically on the parameter of the solar model, and it, it happens that we are just sitting on a metal stability region. So once again, we haven't, we haven't discovered anything. I mean, we haven't discovered any problem in the solar model. So because of this, we cannot tell the solar model will break at some scale, because uh, uh, this problem uh, is not there at all, right, it's metastable. So we, given our measurement at low energy, the standard model, even at multi-loop, uh, is consistent up uh, to very high energy, and so we, we, we didn't discover any other limit of the standard model. Right, this is true only if it's standard model. Okay, so I'll leave you with questions for your review. There are questions for you to answer uh, tonight, maybe. Or after. Thank you very much.